together around Hebrews chapter 4 as our launching off point for my assignment this morning. Uh, over the last few times that I've been here, I've been discussing an important uh, aspect of who we are as faith builders. I've been talking about how faith comes. And we found out that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Faith comes by hearing. And so faith isn't hard. Sometimes people get uh, all uh, under pressure to try to make things happen by faith. And they're trying to make faith work. Uh, in the natural area with their natural abilities and they're trying to believe God and trying to have faith and trying to work faith. But the scripture tells us faith will come by hearing the word. So if I'm hearing the word, that's my part to bring faith into my situation, it, to bring a, a, a supply of faith into my heart. Faith comes by hearing. That is a spiritual law. If I am hearing, then faith is coming, and then I can take that faith that has come into my heart, a supply of faith, and I can begin to take the next step, which is the distribution of that faith by saying. So the faith comes by hearing, and faith is applied to our situations by our speaking. Because we, having the same spirit of faith, we believe... And then we speak, it says in 2 Corinthians. So the believing is the first phase of faith, but it's not the only part of faith. It is necessary to have faith in the heart so that when you open your mouth to speak words, they are words that are filled with faith, not words that you're trying to confess just for the purpose of establishing something because some, some people just become narrow in their sight to see that one aspect of confession, confession, confession. And confession is necessary, but it's not the end all. It's a necessary part, but it's not the end of the equation. If you're confessing out of a heart that is empty of faith, then it's not moving any mountains because it has to be faith-filled words that move the mountains. If any man will say to this mountain and believe in his heart. So it's coming out of a heart that's filled with faith, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks in Matthew chapter 12. So there needs to be an abundance. So we spent a few weeks talking about how to get the, uh, the abundance of faith in the heart to, to make sure that we are continuing in the word until there is an abundant supply of the word in the heart before we open our mouth because it hurts people's faith to make faith declarations out of empty hearts because then they say faith doesn't work but what they were using the equation of faith without all of the elements involved in the equation you see what I'm saying? If, if a person goes around saying and saying and saying and saying and saying, but they haven't taken the time first to establish the word in their heart, remember Jesus said, he said, if you continue in my word, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. But the beginning part of that is the key, continuing in the word. If you abide in my word, he said in John. If you abide in my word, you'll ask what you will. Abiding is the element that is necessary so that there is a fullness of faith when I open my mouth. Amen? Amen? And I have had the experience of being in a specific faith project, and God took me to specific scriptures every day. We took 30 days. You've heard our testimony. There was a, a financial drought in our life, and we, God directed us to turn off all other information for over 40 days. We didn't watch we didn't even watch preaching that didn't pertain to this specific subject. We, we sure didn't watch any TV. The kids, it was summertime. We just put blankets, quilts over all the TVs, and they went outside and jumped on the trampoline because we did not have any TV in the house for anybody. And so we were trying to just uh, uh, saturate ourselves in what the Word of God said about His financial covenant with us. And during this time, there were specific scriptures that I was reading out loud to myself. And the first day I started reading them out loud to myself, it was like a feather coming out of my mouth 
and just floating down to the floor. There was no faith in what I was saying. Because the first process of confessing the word is to get it established in your heart. Meditating in the word, like he said in Joshua chapter 1, you will meditate in this word. He said in Psalm chapter 1, at verses 1 through 3, meditating in the word. That meditating is what causes us to have good success, but it is not just reading it. It is reading it out loud to yourself. It's mumbling it to yourself. You're not saying it for other people to hear it. You're saying it for the purpose of getting it in your ears, into your heart. You're inclining your ear to hear it so that it is in your heart like Proverbs 4, 20 through 22 says. Amen? So during that time, I was quoting the word, and I didn't believe it. I, I mean, I, I was saying things like I'm blessed going in and coming out while I'm eating Vienna sausages out of necessity. Not because we like Vienna sausages. <laughs> Carl Budding ham that we did not get, you know, rolls of Carl Budding ham. We would peel out two little thin strips that you could see through. You could, you could see the light through the Carl Budding ham, and everybody gets two on their bread, one for each slice of bread. And calling myself blessed coming in and blessed going out. So my mind went on till every time I said some of those verses. And so it came out of my mouth, and it just floated down to the ground. But what it was happening, it was going back into my ears. And somewhere in that time... Now, if you would have asked me during that time, are you believing God? I would have said, I believe God. I am believing God. I am in faith about this. But one day I opened up my Bible and I pulled out those same scriptures and I began to read them out loud. And when I opened up my mouth, something came out of my heart that had not been there previously. My heart hit an abundance and out of the abundance of the heart, my mouth began to speak. Amen. And when the word came out of my mouth, it didn't come out like a feather that just floated down to the ground. It came out with force. And I backed up and said, did I say that? Amen. I felt like Urkel for just a minute. You know, did I do that? And it surprised me that when I spoke that, and right then I knew I have not been in faith about this till this moment. Faith came... Through the hearing, I was in the process of building my faith every one of those previous days, but I did not reach a level of faith that was operative until that day. Amen. And I could tell the difference. And that's been, that's been helpful because, because I know now there was a difference between when I was trying to work faith, building my faith, and a difference of what happened when faith came. And when faith came and it began coming out of my mouth, within 30 days, God moved, uh, moved my husband out of full-time work at Blue Cross and made him the pastor of this church. And God began working his plan. And, and we, it, our, our fi not only our finances, but every other aspect of our life changed. We got in the will of God because that area was what was holding us back into going into ministry. That financial area. Amen? Amen. But when I, when I got a fullness of faith, then I knew the difference between what I had previous. What I had before, I had a desire for faith. I knew how, what the Word said, but I didn't have faith for what the Word said in a full enough measure to operate it. That's why the Lord told uh, Charles Capps, don't pray about anything you can't believe me for. Don't pray and ask me for something you can't believe me for. And it shocked Brother Caps. Brother Caps said in his book, I told the Lord, my prayers are about to get really short. <laughs> Don't ask me for anything you can't believe me for. Well, he had been raised in church in a full gospel denomination, and he had been, he prayed scatterload prayers. He prayed around the world, Lord, bless all the missionaries in China. Bless all the missionaries in in." Uh, India, bless. He just prayed these generalized prayers that had like a shotgun effect, no specific targeted effect, 
They just release a little blessing here, release a little faith here, bless my finances, Lord, bless my marriage, bless this. No specific releasing of faith. Of, Father, I believe you for an increase of such and such amount, or I believe you for favor for me to get a better job, or I believe you for whatever, wisdom to know how to get out of debt. He didn't have any specific targeted, and the Lord told him, go to the Word and find the Scriptures and then feed on them. Read them out loud to yourself. And so he took out a yellow legal pad. He wrote those scriptures out. And while he was out on his tractor taking a break, he would get off the tractor and walk back and forth behind his barn with that piece of paper off of that yellow legal pad proclaiming what the Word of God says. And what was on that yellow legal pad he started getting invitations to go preach. And so he made copies and would pass out paper copies. And then one day Buddy Harrison said, let's put this in a book. And today we have the book, God's Created Power for Healing, or God's Created Power for Finances, or God's Created Power was the first one. And it came from his yellow legal pad, what he was using as he was uh, working on the fields. Amen. But it took that, he said it was about a year and a half of him meditating on that scripture before he had a full turnaround. It started before that, but the complete turnaround because he had gotten upside down millions of dollars in debt with his farming uh, because of uh, a wrong leading, how he had misinterpreted something and made some bad decisions and then got negative and started using his mouth to curse everything he did. He said, I, I would say things like, well, if anything's going to get bad, it's going to get bad for me. And if I go out and try to plant my, my seed, I'm probably going to plant it too high and it's going to come a frost. Or I'm going to plant it too low and it's going to come too much rain. And he said his words weren't causing the frost or causing the rain, but they were causing him to make wrong decisions. He was speaking negative words and he kept making the wrong decision. Instead, he said, I had farmed all my life and prospered at farming. I had been a good farmer until I started speaking negative. And that negative, so, so God turned him around and got him on the word. And in quoting the word of God, faith came. And as faith came, he began to ask God. And when he asked God, there was faith in his heart. And that's what we're dealing with is that we are developing to know that Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24 is operative at its highest level. That's the level we all want to work out. If Mark 20, 11, 23 says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Well, we want to be able to say that and have this same result shall not doubt in his heart, Amen. but shall believe. Well, that takes practice, doesn't it? That takes skill in faith. That takes, you, don't, you don't just get up one morning never having used faith before and say, today I am going to say it and I'm not going to doubt it. <laughs> you better have a renewed mind. <laughs> you better have your mind renewed because for you to operate that portion of that instruction, You've got to be practiced in casting down imaginations and every high thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God because what comes to bring doubt is wrong thinking, the I, wrong thoughts, things that come to you and say, it's not working. It's not working because you don't feel any different. It's not working because your finances haven't changed. It's not working because this. It's not working. And if, if, if a person receives that wrong thought and then they give voice to it, now they own it. They have taken that thought by saying and they say, oh, I guess it's not working because we got too much. They turn up Clint when he comes on. They just turn crank Trent, Clint Black right on up. Too much month at the end of my money. Too much. And they just sing right along with him. I got more than enough month, Clint. I got more than enough month. No, there is no end to the money because God, he causes me to uh, abound to every good work. I am enriched to all bountifulness, which causes through me a thanksgiving unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this Mark eleven twenty three that is is a a foundational teaching on faith. Jesus taught us this is how faith operates, but this is how faith operates in the skill of the operation. We all want to set this as our objective, to become ones who can say and not doubt in the heart, 
but believe. Now here's the other aspect. Believe the things I say will come to pass. So for this to operate, you've got to be a person who controls and disciplines your tongue. Because if you walk around all day long saying things you don't mean, it's going to be hard for you to say what you mean when you need to. Amen. Because your spirit doesn't know if it should believe you or not. Remember, he, Brother Cavs, he started saying negative things and making wrong choices. And he said, before that, I knew how to farm. If anything, I knew well, it was how to farm. But when I started saying, well, just watch and see. If it's, it's gonna, I, I hear that a lot. I hear things like that a lot. I was watching a documentary about a medical show, and it was talking about people who come into an ER, and, and, and they were interviewing some of the people, and they were saying, well, you know, in my family, if anything can go bad, it's going to go bad for us. And I thought, I wonder how many times they say that. Pastor and I just both at the same time went, oh, don't, we just want to help people. Stop, stop, get that, here, gargle, gargles, get that out of your mouth. And people say it like they're joking. And they, are, they think they're joking, but what they're doing is programming their spirit in the wrong things. Amen. They're opening the door for the wrong things. Amen. Amen. Amen? So he said that we have to believe that the things we say come to pass. We've got to know that our words, we have, for, for us to be born again, we have to believe in the heart and say... Our salvation, it says, with the heart, confession is, with the, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth, Romans chapter 10, with the mouth, confession is made unto rescue. Confession is made unto liberty. Confession is made unto healing. Confession is made unto deliverance. That, those are the words that define the word salvation. Confession is made unto salvation is not limited to you being born again. In that example it is, believing with the heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and declaring with my mouth that he is my Lord. Hallelujah. So if that most important aspect of our relationship with God has an element that your mouth is required do you think there's going to be less for any other aspect of what you receive from God? It works for every, every aspect of our receiving from the provision of God. Hebrews 4, are you there yet? That was my introduction. Uh, we just recapped. So please go back and watch the, the previous teachings on Faith Comes. And I've taught on it here and I've taught on it in, in uh, the Little Rock campus and all of them have different aspects. So go watch them all. And feed on those because we want to be skilled in our part. Our part is faith. Amen. Our part is the faith part. Amen. And it's not going to happen just because you own a Bible. You, see me smiling at you? I love you enough to tell you it's not going to happen just because you attend faith builders. Amen? It happens because we interact with the word and we yield to uh, the teachings of how to become skilled in our faith. And we put it to work. Hebrews 4, let's look at verse 12. It's speaking of the word of God. So how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word. It says in verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful. The word of God is quick and powerful. Uh, that word quick, can we show the amplified there? That word quick is important because we don't, quite use it the way the King James has it. The Amplified says it is alive, quick. We would, if, we, if you were saying it's quickening, it means it's bringing it to life. So the Word of God is living. The Word of God is living. He's not talking about speed of something being fast. He says the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is a living word. It is not a dead word. It is, not, it is not an empty word. Every word of God is full. Notice what it says, full. The word of God is full. God doesn't own an empty word. You can't find a word that came from God that is lacking 
power or ability or, or is empty on the inside. Every word of God is full. It's full of creative power. It is full of ability. When God uses words, he uses words to transport his power, to transmit his power. If God wants to get power to you, he's going to put it in his word. That's one of the, the primary ways that God gets his power into your life is by his word. He sent his word and healed them. Psalm 107, 20 says, He sent His Word and... He, how did He heal them? He sent His Word. It didn't say He sent His Word to heal them. Why? Because in the transporting of the Word, He put the healing in it. So he, in His understanding, it's already done. Not needing to be done, He sent His Word. And if we receive His Word, what can we receive? Whatever's on the inside of it, what it contains. If I open up the container and allow what's in that container to have its operation in my heart, then I have released what it contained. And every word of God is full, full of power. Pull that amplified back up for me if you would. Full of power. Hallelujah. This word that is full of power, it is active. It says it's made, because it's full of power, it's active, operative, energizing, and effective. Those are all definitions from that word in the original language. When we see here in King James, it says it is powerful. Powerful, it means it is active. It is active. So if you're speaking the word of God or standing on the word of God... And we're talking about in the heart, in the mouth, then the word is active in your life. If you're not speaking it, it's not active. If it's not in your heart and mouth, it's not engaged in the situation. And, and, and this is where people fall into a mental ascent is if they, they, they read it and they say, well, I know that, that God wants me healed and so they just put themselves in waiting. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. God, I know God wants me healed, but I'm waiting for it. Well, for me to bring that word into operation, I need to do the heart and the mouth actions that, that engage it. Hallelujah. The word of God is alive. It is living and it is active. How do I make it active in my life? I put it in my heart and in my mouth. Is that what Romans 10 tells us? We spend a lot of time on Romans 10. Uh, it says, the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. What does it say? It says, the word is near you in your mouth first, in your mouth, and in your heart. So where does the word need to be? If I want the word in my situation, how do I get it in my situation? Not just because I own a Bible is it going to be in my situation. It's going to be in my situation because I put it in my mouth and I put it in my heart and, and now it's in my situation. So if you don't hear your voice saying it, it's not quite in your situation completely. It's not operative in your situation. Uh, me, if, if my mouth isn't saying it, I can know it, but faith doesn't come by knowing. Faith doesn't work by knowing. Faith works by saying, Jesus didn't say, whosoever shall know in his mind. It says that faith comes by saying, whosoever shall say, whosoever will speak the word and know that what I say has power, I'm releasing the power of God. That, that application is with our voice, out of our heart, so we got to first get it in the heart and then we can pull it up and speak it into the situation. So he says the word of God is full of power, making it active, operative, energizing. Hallelujah. Faith isn't magic. Faith isn't... Faith is not... Um, necessarily immediate. 
Sometimes people think if it doesn't happen like uh, if they, they drive through and they get their food immediately or they pop it in the microwave and they get it quickly and they want faith to be something that they can just pop right out of their heart, out of their mouth and just boom, it's there in their life. But that's not how the operation of faith works. Jesus spoke to this tree and you couldn't see what happened to that tree while they were standing there. But they came back the next day and they saw the effects of what he had said. Right. It started working the moment he said it, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it until the next day. Right. Amen? Amen? There are some things that, that, that that's where people miss it, is that if they don't see it or feel it or, or, or have a natural evidence that it's changed, they don't think it's worked yet, but faith knows that they have it, whether I see it, whether I feel it. I have it because I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. So the Word is alive and active, full of power, active, operative, energizing, one translation says, full of power to achieve results. The Word of God is full of power to achieve results. If we need to see result in that area, then let's start putting the Word on it, confident that the Word is full of power to achieve the result that we need in this situation. It is a living, active power that's in the Word. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ, the word of God, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. So the gospel of Christ is the word concerning what Jesus has accomplished for us. The word about Jesus being anointed and going about doing good and healing all. For God was with him. Amen? The, that's what, that's what uh, Peter was preaching in Acts 10.38 to Cornelius when they all got saved without anybody even having an altar call. They got saved while they were hearing it. They're like, I received that. I received that, I received that, and they were so receptive that when the Holy Spirit, they just received the Holy Spirit too. Amen? So, so what was he preaching? The, the gospel of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen? And so this gospel of Christ is everything Jesus uh, accomplished for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's the victory we have in Christ. It's the new creature we are in Christ. It's the overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony that we have. It's our more than a conqueror position. Amen. This gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel, the preaching of the word is the power of God. The power of God. The power of God unto salvation. Can we make sure we have the Bible definition for salvation? This word means rescue, Amen. liberation, preservation, healing, prosperity, restoration. I'm going to go through those again. Rescue, liberation, preservation, healing, prosperity restoration all of those are in the strong's concordance when you look up this word salvation sozo in the original language so it is including our being able to be saved born again that's included but that's not the limit it says the preaching of the word of god the gospel of christ is the power of god unto rescue the power of God unto liberation. The power of God that preserves you. The power of God that provides healing. The power of God that provides financial prosperity. Or prosperity in your marriage. Or prosperity in your family relationships. It means restoration. 
restoring you to a life of wholeness. The word restores us to a life of wholeness. That's why we don't just interact with the word just to get born again, but we continue interacting with the word because God is continually restoring our life, reproviding things that have been broken or lost or, or destroyed. Amen? So the gospel, the preaching of the word, is how God gets the power of that salvation into our lives. The power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. Now, if you go back to Hebrews 4, but this time I want to look at a previous verse in that text, we'll find out that we can learn from the mistakes of the children of Israel under the Old Testament. It says in the beginning of the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, the beginning of this chapter, it says, let us fear or be on guard or have respect or pay attention to this, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest or his provision, any of us should seem to come short of it. In other words, let's be on guard that we don't fall short of receiving his promises. For unto us was the gospel preached just like it was preached to them. As well as unto them, the gospel was preached. What's the gospel? The power of God. The gospel was preached to us, but the word preached to them did not profit them. Why? They, they heard the word, so faith came, but they left it. They didn't embrace it and allow that faith to be acted upon. It says they did not mix with faith the words they heard. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So faith came, but they didn't mix it into their heart. They didn't grab it in and start putting it in their mouth and in their heart. Who, and, and who is this referring to? Children of Israel into the promised land. God had Moses send out the spies. They came back. The majority of the spies had an evil report of the land. What did they say that was evil? They said, we be not able. We are like grasshoppers in our own sight. So they came back with a, a report that was based on what they could see and what they could feel. And God called it evil. Because it disagreed with him. It disagreed with what he had said. What he had said was true. God had given them a word. He had already preached to them the word necessary for them to receive what they needed in that land. He had preached the, the word of victory to them and they didn't put that victory in their heart and in their mouth. Two people did. Amen. Joshua and Caleb, they put in their mouth the same thing God had said. And they said, we be more than able. We are more than able. Let's go right now. We are more than able. They were, they were walking around saying, gargle, please, get that out of your mouth, gargle. It, they tried to hush the people up. They tried to get them to be quiet. Come on, don't say that out of your mouth. Don't say we be not able. Because those, those ten spies had the evil report, and it spread through millions of people in the camp. Amen. And all the people of adult responsible age never got in because and then the next day they decided okay we're going to change our mind we be able well let's go up uh -uh. you've already established your defeat don't go but they did and they got defeated and but you know what joshua and caleb led the next generation into the promised land because they never changed saying what God had said from the beginning. Amen. They mixed with faith what they heard by putting it in their mouth and in their heart. Amen? Amen. So this is where we are. we are. We are that people who are putting the word of God in our mouth. You don't have to... The first time you say it, you may not feel like you believe it. But choose to believe it. Believing is not a feeling anyway. 
Believing is not a feeling. Feelings will follow it. You'll, you'll, you'll come to the, that place that there's a confidence in what you're saying. But the first time you might say it, remember, I felt like I, my, head was, my head was going on tilt every time I said it. Because I was still eating the Vienna sausages and Carl Budding ham. I could see through it. <laughs> and so there wasn't a feeling, but I had to say it so that faith would come. I had to mix it with faith into my life. By saying it so that faith would come into my heart. And when faith came in a fullness, it, it came out of my mouth in a fullness. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that turned the situation. That's when the mountains started moving. When there were faith in my words. When there was a fullness of faith in my words. And so that's what we're talking about. Mixing the word with faith in our heart by speaking it out of our mouth. Mark chapter 5, let's see this in action. Let's see an example of this. Mark chapter 5, I'm going to read uh, verses 25 through 30, reading here concerning the woman who was healed of the issue of blood. Mark 5, 25, it says, There was a certain woman which had an issue or a flow of blood 12 years. Can you imagine the weakness? The lack of energy, the, the, the physical uh, um, and social separation. She had been on quarantine a long time. Twelve years she was not able to interact with people like a normal relationship. She had to separate herself because of the condition that she was suffering. And it said that she had suffered many things of many physicians. So there had been a lot of, of, of uh, trials and clinical trials that she had gone through, huh? And, you know, if you read any history, and uh, they probably did some leeches and drew blood with her leeches. They probably gave her all kinds of nasty stuff that had nasty effects. She had suffered many things. And, and in this, she had spent all that she had. And was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment because, or for, she said. So for is another word of for because. So now we know why did she get out of her house and come in the press and with the purpose of touching his garment, what was her motivation? Because she said, because she said, if, and, and the Amplified, go ahead and flip to Amplified right here in verse 33. For she said, so when we read from the Amplified, we see an interesting thing about this verse or this word in the original language. It's a present progressive word. She kept saying. So present progressive, for all of you, it's been a while since we've been in English class. Let's go back to English class just for a moment. If I say uh, I ran, you can think that she ran once. But if I say I, I, kept, I, I, I kept running, every day I kept running, then you would see that that was something I did daily. It was something that was, it was a progressive action. A progressive action. So to say she said, it did not use that verb. And in Spanish, we have two different words. Uh, with, there's a, a verb that will be used if you just do it one time. And there's a different verb that you would use if it was something that you did like every summer or something that you did, uh, uh, you know, all the time. And it uses that word because in the original language, it uses a word that describes something that was a continual action. She kept saying. She kept saying something. She kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I will be restored to health. 
if I own, if just touch his garments, if I can touch his garments, if I just touch his garments, I don't need to have to touch his elbow. I don't need to have to touch his hair. I don't have to touch his shoulder. He doesn't have to lay hands on me. If I just touch his garments, I shall be restored. What's on her mind? Restored, restored, restored. I shall be restored. I shall be restored. That's what's on her mind. Amen. That's what's, this is her faith talking. What we say is our faith talking. This is how faith is released. What she said was her faith speaking. We know what was abundantly in her heart because it's what kept coming out of her mouth. Out of the abundance of her heart, she brought something out. And we have it on record. Amen. We have the abundance of this woman's heart. And it got so abundant in her heart that it started moving her feet to get up out of her house, to leave her house and go into an area she had not been in a press of people, right? It, it, she was taking steps she had not taken before, going in a direction she had not taken before because there was something abundantly in her heart that was directing her to her answer. And it was, I shall be restored to health. She began to see herself restored to health. Every time she said that, she could see herself. Twelve years is a long time. For someone to get a different image in their spirit after having spent 12 years dealing with the failure after failure after failure and, and dead end after dead end after dead end and no results and losing money and, and every time I'm getting lower and lower in my savings. She's at the end of all that and something has caused her to start saying something different. If I just touch the hem of his garments, I shall be whole. Amen. And straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body. Now, we don't always have an immediate feeling. We don't always have an immediate evidence in the natural, but she did. Straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she knew, she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus knew something. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, circle that word virtue because we have another New Testament example. I think it's over in Timothy where he's saying, add, or, or Peter, where he's saying, add to your, add to your faith virtue. He's, it, that's a different word. This word in the Strong's Concordance is the word dunamis, the same word that we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It's the word power talking about explosive power, talking about miracle working power. Jesus knew in himself that dunamis, miracle-working power, had gone out of him. And he didn't do it. He did not initiate the release of this power. He did not release or transmit by his choice this power into her body. But he knew that someone had made a connection to that power and that power had flowed out of his body. He knew that dunamis, miracle power, had gone out of him. And he wanted to hear the good report. He stopped and turned around and said, who touched my clothes? He knew how they had accessed it. Who touched my clothes? And, of course, the disciples, they're stuck in the mental arena, you know, the mind, the natural. They're, they're, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? Everybody. We are being, uh, everybody is trying to reach out and grab you. But he wasn't talking about that. He wasn't talking about just that natural touch. He wanted to know who touched me with faith. Who mixed faith and reached out and made a connection to the miracle-working power that is resident in me? As Christ, the anointed one. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all. Amen? Amen. Who connected with that anointing? How did they connect? We're going to find out. He said, who touched me? 
They said, Lord, everybody's touching you. He looked around to see her who had done this thing. The woman, verse 33, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. What does salvation mean? Restoration was one of the words, wasn't it? Restored to wholeness. He said faith restored her. Her faith has made her whole. We just read it was his power. <laughs> Did we just read it was his power? Did it say he knew that miracle power had gone out of him? Well, we see that the power went out of him, but there were a lot of other people touching him and didn't get any of that power. So what directed that power? Faith directed the power. You know, you can walk into to a house that is in process of being built that doesn't have electrical wiring in that house yet, and it can look like this is a great house. You could even put some, some plugs up there, right? You can, you can wire all the inside of the house and not run the wire to the pole. And it can look like there's a power supply in the house. You can look and say, there's an outlet, and there's an outlet, and, and, and there's some light fixtures. But if it's not running to the power supply, then you're not going to get the lights to come on. You can flip the switch, plug in to the outlet, but if it's not connected to a power supply, then it's not going to conduct the power from the pole through the wires into the different outlets and light fixtures that you have wired for that. And so there are a lot of, a lot of people who love the Lord, they love Jesus, they're going to go to heaven because at some point they made that one wire connection to their being born again and Jesus dying on the cross. But they are not wired for anything else in their house. They're not wired for restoration. And those they sing, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. They're not wired for, for Malachi 3.10. They're not Malachi, they're, they're not wired for, for Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches. And they're not wired for you're an heir and a joint heir with Christ. They haven't wired that into their house. They just got that one wire. They can plug in one thing. I'm going to heaven. And that's the only thing they can plug in in their house. Because there's no other outlets. This is our wiring. Faith wires us to the ability of God. Amen. Faith wires our lives for the ability of God to come into the different aspects. So God's not just a God who wants to, to redeem us from uh, uh, going to hell so he can take us to heaven. He's also a God who wants to redeem our lives from destruction. He's also a God who wants to redeem us from depression or oppression. He wants to redeem us from physical sicknesses. He's, all of those are, are available, but the word wires us to it. Wires it into so that it can come into our home, into our life, and be lived out. Amen? So Jesus said faith made her whole. But we read that it was God's power, but faith gives power action. Faith is the wiring that brings that power into our lives, that, that, that conducts the power of God. Would you say that if you were looking at it from an electrical aspect and you were saying this power, this dunamis that was on Jesus, that if we were to liken it to electricity, that she... She had something that none of the other people had that would conduct the power correctly. So let's say that somebody brought their, their um, Reynolds wrap. And they said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some power with my Reynolds wrap. I'm going I'm I'm to take this whole package of Reynolds wrap and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, wrap it really tight and I'm going to get the power to flow from that into this device with my Reynolds wrap. 
Is aluminum foil going to conduct electricity? What if they come in and they say, I don't want to use Reynolds wrap. I want to use some saran wrap. Oh. Is the saran wrap going to conduct electricity? Oh, it's not the right substance to conduct electricity. You've got to have the right substance to conduct the electricity into your life. So can need conduct electricity from the power of God into our life? But I need it, Lord. I need it. I need this financial increase. I need healing. and I need it. I need it. I need it. Lord, please heal me. I need it. Need is like saran wrap. It doesn't conduct the power of God. Faith, remember he said it, the preaching did not profit because they didn't mix it with faith. Faith is the proper substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the proper substance to conduct the provision of God, the salvation of God, the healing of God, the prosperity of God, the restoration of God, the liberty into our lives. Hallelujah. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word. So you don't even have to figure out how to get faith. You don't have to make faith happen. If you, if you just put your responsibility of getting the word in your heart, faith will happen. Amen. Faith, faith comes. Amen? It's not, it's not a sometimes hope so, maybe so. No, if you're hearing the word, faith will come, and then you mix it by putting it in your mouth. Amen? And you own it. He said, Jesus said in Matthew 6, take no thought by saying. Well, you're not supposed to take anxious, worried thought, but you need to take some 1 Peter 2.24 uh, 2 thought by saying. You need to say, I own that one right there. 1 Peter 2.24, that belongs to me. I own that. I take it into ownership in my life, into my possession. Work that ponytail. Come on. Come on, work that ponytail. Get that scripture and say, that belongs to me. Hallelujah. Uh, Luke chapter 5. For all of you who wonder what does she mean by work that ponytail. <laughs> oh, have mercy. See me after church. No. <laughs> That, that it's something that someone's in, you, in telling a story was saying, come on, girl, work that ponytail, own that ponytail, make that, and because she was flipping her ponytail and just, woo, owning that ponytail. Well, you got to take the word and you got to say, I own this. First Peter 2, 24 is mine. It is from, Jesus died for me. By his stripes, I am healed. I own it. Amen. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work it. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, take full advantage of having that in my life. So, praise God. Luke chapter 5, are you there? Let's look over here at verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day that he, speaking of Jesus, was teaching. Jesus was teaching. So the word's going forth, isn't it? Faith is coming because they're hearing the word. Jesus was teaching. It says there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem. Notice, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. How, how was the power present? The power's in the Word. Jesus was teaching the Word, so the power was present. Do you remember in Acts chapter 11? Uh, he, when Cornelius was telling what the angel had told him, he said, the angel said uh, that I was to call for Peter and that Peter would come and preach words whereby me and my family would be saved. In the words that Peter preached, me and my family would be saved. In the words, words whereby we would be saved. Words. So Jesus is teaching words. Was there a man uh, who... Uh, it, I think it was uh, Paul was preaching and he noticed as he was preaching that this man had faith to be healed. 
He didn't lay hands on him. He didn't transmit anointing to him. But he just looked at him and realized he's got faith. How did he get that faith to be healed? By hearing the word that Paul was preaching. And Paul said, stand up right on your feet. And the man stood up and was healed. Had never walked in his life. But how did he get healed? The word was preached. And it says here that Jesus was teaching and the power of the Lord was present. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. But do you notice as we read here, they didn't get healed. But the, the power was present, but they didn't get it. The power was present, but they didn't conduct it into their lives. They didn't mix it into their life. They didn't reach out and embrace it into their lives. It says that someone did, though. It says that... Hallelujah. I'm going to read the Weiss translation before I move on to the next verse here. The Weiss of verse 17 says, The Lord's power was with him for the purpose of healing. The purpose of his service, his meeting, the purpose was for healing. And none of them got the healing that was in the purpose of him having this discussion, this teaching time. It says, Behold, men brought in a bed, a man that was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude. There's a lot of people here. They can't even get an aisle up to, up, up to Jesus. There are so many people, there are no aisles to walk this man in. That means they have used all of the aisle space from the entrance to where Jesus was, was packed with people and nobody was connecting. Nobody was receiving from the power that was present. Hallelujah. But they were looking for a way. What were they, what was, why, why did they want to get him to Jesus? Because they wanted the power in Jesus to get into that man. They had faith in the power. They had faith and they just, we got to get him up there. So they went to the top of the roof. It says they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. So they took time to find some rope. They took time to figure out how to all of them working together. Can you imagine the trust that man had to have that his friends are going to lower him and not drop him? I mean, have y'all practiced this yet? Has anybody been practicing? Have y'all ever moved with anybody and you thought, have mercy? They've never moved before. You ever moved with anybody and you can tell they've never moved a couch before? They've never moved something big and heavy before and you're doing all the lifting or, or, or you're like having to, okay, come on, let me, let me go backwards. <laughs> well, had they ever let anybody, had they been skilled in letting people down through the roof? No, probably not. They probably weren't skilled in lowering this man, but they were determined. <laughs> we're going to get him to where the power is. And so they lowered him down and... When Jesus, when he saw their faith, Amen. when he saw their faith, Amen. what did he see? Did he see them confessing? Oh, he's going to be healed in Jesus' name. He's going to be healed. First Peter. No, they weren't confessing. They were acting on their belief. That if we can, if I can just touch his garment, that's what her faith was. Amen. If I can just touch his garment. Well, they are displaying their faith by their actions that have not given up when there was no aisle and no way to get in through the multitude. So they found another way to get to Jesus and Jesus saw it as faith. He said these were faith actions. Why? Because what they were saying is if I can get him to Jesus... If we can get him to Jesus, it doesn't, in, in other words, I'm not planning to need to pull him back up, up through this roof. <laughs> We're going to let him down, but we don't need to pull him back up. I mean, they weren't saying, are we strong enough to get him back up? No, as long as we're strong enough to lower him down. That's all that matters. We don't need to hoist him back up. 
Because if we get him down in the presence of Jesus, he'll walk home. Amen. Amen. Jesus saw their faith. And he said, your sins. Wait. He said, your sins are forgiven? I thought the man needed healing. He needs salvation, doesn't he? Hallelujah. And everybody else sitting around there said, what? Who can forgive sins? What are you talking about forgive sins? Forgive sins. And Jesus asked them a question. Verse 23. Whether it's easier to say, your sins be forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. Which one's easier? Because it's the same power of salvation that does them both. Amen. The salvation includes them both. It includes the sins forgiven and it includes the restoration and it includes the liberation and it includes the healing and it includes the prospering and it includes the liberation. They're all inclusive. So which one's easier? They're both easy. I always think it's interesting that the people of that day argued about Jesus being able to forgive sin. But today, most denominations will argue not about Jesus. Oh, they will all agree Jesus will forgive sin, but most will deny that Jesus heals today. When Jesus said, they're both easy. Because they're both included in his salvation. The same anointing that heals is the same anointing that frees us from the bondage of sin. Hallelujah. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority. This word is authority, not dunamis, but exousia. That the Son of Man has authority upon the earth to forgive sin. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise. Take up your couch and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereupon they, he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They're both easy. They're both easy. Hallelujah. Why? Because they're salvation. Hallelujah. Our part is done with the heart and the mouth. Not with our head, not with our emotions, not with our feelings. We believe it in our heart and we co confess it or declare it with our mouth. That's, our, that's believing and speaking. That's the action of faith. So if someone comes to me and says, well, I'm believing for, there are times I will ask them, what scripture are you standing on? Because I want to identify, are you using saran wrap? Or do you have a good wire that will conduct this to you? And if they say, well, I'm just I'm just asking God to do it. I'm just believing God will do it. If you don't have a scripture, then faith hasn't come and you're using need or want or, or necessity or desire to try to conduct the power of God into your situation. Amen. With a scripture, I build my receiving I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to do God's part in giving it to me. It's mine in Christ, but the receiving has to be developed. So to build the, the receiving, I've got to meditate or feed on that scripture. Brother Hagen was a man who was greatly used of God, Kenneth E. Hagen, greatly used of God to minister uh, healing ministry 
was probably the most predominant thing in his ministry because he was healed uh, off of a deathbed when he was uh, 13, 14 years old. I might be wrong on the exact age that he was. I think 16. He was 17, but he had been in bed for like a year and a half, uh, a little over a year and a half. He had been in this bed. They had told him he would never become an adult. He would never have a natural life. He had been born premature. His grandmother, it, he was born premature, and the doctor laid him on a napkin, wrapped up the napkin, and said to his grandmother, he didn't make it, you can bury him. And she was headed out the back door with her shovel to bury him in the garden. He was so little. And she said, as I picked up, she had her coat on, she had the shovel in her hand, and when she picked up the napkin, she noticed him breathe. And she had to feed him with an eyedropper, and he would gag on the milk because he was so undeveloped in his digestive system. Even as a young boy, he said, when I drank something cold, I could feel it all through my chest because he was so undeveloped in his interior, in his inside organs. Had a heart condition, uh, had, uh, say a heart condition, it wasn't all the way formed had a, a blood condition. When they would take blood, it was orange. He said he thinks it was leukemia as he grew older and realized what some of the things were, but they, didn't, they just called it a blood condition. It was the early 50s, I think it was. He was he, or I'm not sure exactly, 40-something. Somebody help me. Google it. Kenneth E. Hagen, when was he born? Uh, but regardless, God raised him up and healed him. And he w began preaching the word of God and went continually preaching the word of God. And one of the things that so struck me was he said his wife was at home with his children and she, co she contacted him, I think it was through a letter because they didn't do a whole lot of phone calls. And, and he got the letter and it said there was something wrong with his daughter. And Brother Hagen said, he, he's out on the field preaching and ministering healing and seeing people get healed, seeing people, uh, you know, receiving miracles from God. He's preaching it every day, preaching all of these scriptures. But he said, before I prayed for my daughter, I spent the next few days feeding on scriptures. He said it was separate from what I was studying for my sermons, I would spend extra time separately feeding myself on scriptures until he got to a place where he released his faith for his daughter to be healed. And she was healed Amen. of that growth that was on her eye that was uh, like a significant growth and, and everything. She was healed, but notice he didn't just jump out and say, Oh, in the name of Jesus, and, and uh, based on what he'd been preaching, he fed on scriptures till faith came. He mixed his faith with it in his own personal life before he released his faith to pray about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How much more do we need to make sure that we're giving a, an emphasis to the word so that we have established in our heart before we go to God to try to lay hold of it. Amen? Amen? Mixing faith with the word. Faith gives power action. Father, we are thankful that you have brought these things to our attention and we will give our diligence to our part. Would you say that with me, Father? I will give my diligence to my part of your, of your word. I will attend to your word. I will, to your word. I will put it in my heart, in my heart. Until, a faith until a full measure of faith is produced. Is produced. And, I and I will see your results, your results in, my life. in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I believe you've received today I've stirred myself. Let's stand together, if you would, please. Tonight, please come back for more. Can, can you take any more? 
I mean, is there anything more you could receive from God? Or are you saying, no, I'm just too full? No, we, need we need more, we don't need we? Yes. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to be continuing with, uh, 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 not with this subject, but we're going to continue in the Word tonight. And we're going to be uh, learning how to make a joyful noise, how to let the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, be established in our lives. So please, uh, this is something that God has continually brings me back to as a element of victory for us. And we need that victory operative in our life. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.